I'm spiritual. I'm on a spiritual journey. What does it even mean? And what what is the relation of spirituality and religion? Is it the same? Is it different? Religion binds you down and spirituality sets you free. Beautiful. Religion is a way of creating divisions and religion has never been about the things that you do and has always been about the person that you are. What are people searching for? Well, the number one thing that everyone is searching for is contentment. Mm-hmm. but they don't know that they're looking for contentment what is sikhi about it is a way of understanding suffering guru nanak dev ji famously teaches us nanak dukhiya sab sansar i've seen so many people talk about their suffering and how they're bigger than other people's problems of all the things that is causing your suffering the biggest one is your sense of self importance and as long as you don't feel that connection that you're one with something far greater you feel small and limited you feel trapped What is the best way to deal with grief if we had to? We get told that time is the biggest healer and that's actually not true. Acceptance is the biggest healer. It's good to experience a range of emotions, but if you knew what peace was, you would not want to go on the emotional roller coaster all the time. You don't want to go very high and very low all the time. You're just floating above. and it's a really good place to be sikhi and gurmat and the teachings of the guru how do you want it integrated in the community we proudly say that he traveled all over the world teaching to all communities and yet we're not doing that it doesn't have to be done wearing a kurta pajama it could be done in in english right. in everyday modern clothes using everyday examples and number one comment is going to be punjabi ch gal kyon nahi kiti guru nanak dev ji didn't teach in punjabi guru granth sahib ji has at least 13 14 different languages so i want sikhi to be taught in chinese in spanish in portuguese in every language under the sun Hi Satwal. <laughs> nice to meet you. How are you doing? Nice to meet you as well. Welcome to Chai with Tea. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, it was one of the things that I had written and I was telling you off camera um that if I want to have a conversation about spirituality, it has to be with Satwal. Oh, okay. And you're Thank you. here. Look at that. In, in the flesh. <laughs> um one of the first things I want to talk about is your organization. Um Nanak Nam was started 10 years ago. Uh, why did you decide to start it? What was the need? um and how has it evolved over the years it never started as an organization it really just started as a passion project for me um my background was in it and at the same time i also had a real passion for learning the deeper spiritual meaning of the tradition that i was brought up into so sikhi sikhism um around about the age of 1920 i started to discover that there was a lot more to it and trying to delve into the philosophy of it rather than just the kind of the religious practices and as my interest increased mm-hmm. i started to learn about things like meditation and going within yourself and eventually it had such a profound impact on my own life that i couldn't believe that nobody else was talking about it and it didn't seem to be mainstream within the religion that i was part and parcel of right. so i used to go to youth camps and and gurdwaras and i used to talk about this and eventually i just realized that with my it background that there was a huge gap in this content being available online mm-hmm. we're talking about 2010 2011 no one was really doing anything like this online right. and so for me it was combining my it background with my interest in spirituality yeah. and saying maybe i could do something um but it was never a career it was never an organization i just thought well i'm going to these places and talking about it anyway mm-hmm. so i i bought you know the cheapest camera i could find and and put it on and knew nothing about sound or or good camera quality or anything i just put it online and just thought let me let me see if 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 it changes my life mm-hmm. maybe it can change other people's lives right. and that's really just where it started how has it changed your life what's been the biggest learning in the last 10 years I mean there's so much demand for someone to explain to them the traditions that they've been born into and I'm so blessed that I've been somehow put into that position and people look to me and say you're the one that's actually explaining th- this to us I can't tell you the number of times people say we've been in this tradition our whole life we've learned the prayers we grow up doing japji sahib we do the part our parents told us to to learn kirtan go to the gurdwara but nobody explained it to us before 
And the big change in my life was realizing this is so impactful mm -hmm. in people's lives. This really can change a lot of people's lives. And, and so much so, I've had on countless occasions people come up to me and say, I wouldn't actually be here if it wasn't for you explaining it to me. Oh, wow. My life was going so low. And, and that's where I realized the power of Gurbani. I mean, I knew the impact that it had in my life. But when you see people who go through real struggles, and still the, the, the wisdom that you enjoy and, 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 and like to talk about and, and have a passion for, when you see it lift people up from real depths of darkness, it's humbling. It's really humbling. Absolutely. What does being a Sikh mean to you? Being a Sikh to me is very little to do with appearance, very little to do with practice very little to do with following a religion or belonging to a group. To me, it's about self-discovery. Mm. Being a Sikh is about having the guidance to realize something far deeper about yourself, about who you are, what we really are. And I think that to me was the, the, the thing that just got me interested in the first place of you know, you, you, you get brought up in a religion and you learn how to do all of the, mm -hmm. the things so that you just fit in. You know how to do the prayers, you look the part. I call it the Sunday six. I was brought up in a family. Right. Monday to Saturday, you get on with your life and then Sunday you go to the Gurdwara. And when I started to realize that what the religion was talking about was more to do with me mm -hmm. and my mind and how I think and how I feel and why I make certain decisions the way I do. That's when it really became interesting to me. I said, like, oh, Guru Nanak, the founder of this tradition, is not trying to get me to believe in some God in the clouds right. who you can just pray to when you need some good things to happen in your life. Guru Nanak was trying to hold a mirror up to me and say, let me show you what's going on inside your own mind. That to me is so fascinating. And it still blows my mind every single day. Right. Uh, do you think because the world is so chaotic at the moment, people are looking for answers more. Um, they are trying to look within themselves. They are trying to find something that gives them peace, happiness. I think the world has always been chaotic. I think human beings have always been chaotic because the mind is chaos. Mm. What the difference is now is we've never had access to information the way we have before. True. You know, when we were younger, if you needed to learn something, you had to physically walk to the library, hope that your local library had a book on the subject that you were interested in, and that was it. If they did, they didn't. And then the only other hope that you had was to then go and just talk to other people, to your elders. So your way of gathering information was extremely limited. Mm -hmm. Now, on your phone, yeah. you have access to all the world's information. So your ability to now really find truth and find a truth in a way that makes sense to you has just opened up. And that's really in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I don't think more people are looking. I'd say more people are finding now. Oh, that's that's a good way to put it. But I also find because we have access to information, we are exposed to a lot more pain and suffering as well. I feel like we never knew earlier in some isolated part of the world um, so many painful things are happening. Yes. So many people are getting hurt. And now it's in our face every second day. Yes. You, you scroll and you see these faces and you feel, by the time you've done scrolling, you literally feel a lot lower than you were feeling earlier, Depleted. right? Depleted. Yeah. And it is debilitating. It's not your pain, but it's a collective pain that you're carrying on your shoulders. Yeah. Um, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Well, the phone is a really good way to <laughs> distract you as well, isn't it? You yeah. could, the, the great thing about, especially social media is, you can curate the kind of information that distracts you. If, you. if you're really interested in the news and the media, it's going to keep serving you those things. And if you're interested in, I do a lot of cooking at home, so I'm always getting recipe ideas and that's what's on, right. on my feed. If you're into sports, you can do that. So I find, yes, you're right, that you are getting exposed to all of the, the chaos that's happening in the world, mm -hmm. but now you also have a way to distract yourself like, 24 hours a day. Yeah. We've never had that before. True, true. Um, spirituality. 
this term is thrown out a lot these days, especially thrown around. Um, everybody's spiritual. I'm spiritual. <laughs> I'm on a spiritual journey. What does it even mean? And what what is the relation of spirituality and religion? Is it the same? Is it different? Um, I think it was always meant to be the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. Mm -hmm. And the way I summarize it is religion binds you down and spirituality sets you free. Beautiful. Religion is a way of creating divisions, saying that I belong to this group. This is my teacher. This is my holy book. These are my people. Spirituality is trying to create a sense of union mm. where you look at all people and say, these are my people. You look at all wisdom and say, yes, this wisdom applies to me in some way. And you don't hold on to certain characteristics like we are the people that only have to dress a certain way. We only have to look a certain mm -hmm. way. And I know the people watching are going to say, but you do look a certain way. But for me, I look this way as reminders to my spirituality. If there was no other human being on earth, I strongly feel I would still look like this. I don't look like this to fit into a group. Mm. I look like this because these are reminders for me for the spiritual wisdom that I, that I, that I love to practice. What are people searching for when, when you meet people doing workshops, when you're interacting with them? What is the number one question that, gets asked? Well, the number one thing that everyone is searching for is contentment. Mm. But they don't know that they're looking for contentment. So they ask me issues to do with their family. How do I deal with a difficult family member that I have to live with? How do I make difficult decisions? I get asked philosophical questions. What happens to us when we die? Mm. Is everything God's will or do I have free will? People ask all of these things. And the interesting thing is when you know that ultimately people are looking for peace, mm -hmm. they're hoping that if they get the answer to the next question, then they will find peace. But you know, and I know that questions just raise more questions. Right. And whatever question they ask and whatever answer they hear, it brings up new questions. So questioning and answers, as important as it is, you'll notice that our parents and our pr previous generations, they never asked questions. Exactly. Yeah. You know, we even got told by mm -hmm. our parents saval ni puchida honda that's true yeah asi kadi pucheni yeah we never ask questions don't yeah. ask questions right yet we have a generation now who's brought up with a very different way of learning mm -hmm. critical thinking they've been taught oh, that to question everything mm -hmm. and so we're finding that certainly within the sikh tradition and maybe most traditional religions they don't have the people in place that can actually answer a lot of these important life questions. People don't want to hear stories anymore. They don't want to hear what some Baba's gurus, mm -hmm. magic men were doing 500 years ago, because what they're really thinking is, but on Monday morning, I have to go to work and I, I'm dealing with a colleague who is really aggressive with me, or I'm dealing with pressures of trying to manage my job and look after my parents and try and improve my career and paying the rent. That's my question. So That's what people are looking for. How do I actually deal with real life? And so one of the things that I try to do with my work is always position this ancient timeless wisdom mm. into their daily life and say, what does this mean for you in your daily life? And that's right. really what everyone wants to know. You know, one, one thing that always comes up in conversations is meditation. A lot of people talk about it. Um, a lot of people have changed their lives, apparently. Um, I've tried meditating. Hasn't really worked for me. Um, I'm going to keep trying until I can block out the noises. If somebody had to start meditating, uh, what are some of the key points that they need to keep in mind? And how do you block out the noise when you're thinking about the kids' school, when you're thinking about the chores, when you're thinking about the in-laws, the stresses, the bills to pay, all of that? So I'll, I'll answer that question with, with two parts. Okay. One of the problems with how people approach spirituality, meditation, yoga these days is that they are interested in learning the techniques and they are being taught techniques without being taught the underlying wisdom that always went to this. Mm -hmm. You never went to a, a guru in India back in the day and say, just tell me the technique. Because the guru will say, that's, that's giving you half the 
half the thing. It's like me giving you a tool but not giving you the instructions on how to use the tool. Right. And the tool without instructions is dangerous. So people want to know and are actively going to yoga classes and and places like that and they're learning techniques without learning the underlying wisdom so i'm not surprised that you would say that i've tried meditation and it doesn't work because that's that's a lot of people's experience you have to learn the meditation with the wisdom that says this is what meditation is supposed to be doing this is what you're trying to do mm-hmm. it's like me telling you to just go into a swimming pool and just off you go no instruction just try to get to the other side you can see other people swimming and you're standing in the pool or you say but it's not working for me because you don't have the instructor so that's very important anyone who's trying meditation without spending the time learning the wisdom behind it understanding what is this actually trying to do you're not going to get very far what what are we afraid of why are there so many fears when it comes to traditions and um rituals and things that we should be doing or were doing when we were kids because we were told to as we grow up why do they get sidelined why why are we afraid what are we afraid of i think we are less afraid and more put off mm-hmm. by what we see when you go to religious centers when you meet people who claim to be religious and are reading all the prayers every day but you don't see that having an impact in their life and you say but that person is still a cruel person to mm-hmm. me i get this question a lot mm-hmm. especially from from young ladies who are saying my mother-in-law does part every day yeah but she's really cruel to me mm. that's what puts people off and i've heard from people saying my uncle abused me and he had a dastar on his head and so now all sick men with the star on the heads are now represented by that that's what people are put off by they're put off by people who look religious but don't have the characteristics that go with it. Right. And religion has never been about the things that you do and has always been about the person that you are. What is Sikh about? What if you had to say five philosophies, core philosophies of Sikhi to somebody who's probably not even aware what Sikhism is and probably is really curious and wants to know um what would you say to them? Sikhi to me is an amazing way to live your everyday life. Mm-hmm. I now call Sikhi a tried and tested and the most successful method of happiness. There are so many different methods of happiness. Society will tell you you will be happy when you are successful in your career. when you have the relationship when you have the money when you have all the material goods then you will be happy spiritual masters has, will always tell you yes but what happens when you start losing those things can you still be happy right spirituality and sikhi is a method of happiness regardless of what happens around you could you elaborate on that i would love to know more it is a way of understanding suffering When you understand suffering and what is causing your suffering in your life and by the way everyone is suffering Guru Nanak Dev Ji famously teaches us Nanak dukhiya sab sansar Guru Nanak says the whole world is suffering the Buddha also said the same thing life is suffering we're all suffering we're all searching for contentment and peace that's the one thing that gets us out of bed in the morning the fear that if i don't do all these things i'm going to be in poverty i'm going to miss something out and deep rooted underneath that i'm going to be missing out on peace which every human being intrinsically feels like life should be good life should be peaceful we all somehow know that life should be happy no one accepts suffering everyone knows life should be better but they don't know the method of happiness mm. and so what wisdom and spiritual wisdom has always taught us is okay you want peace now you need to know what are the things that are blocking your peace and it turns out that there's only a handful of things that are blocking your peace number 1 your attachments to other things we don't want anything to change in our life we don't want things to move like if i have a good relationship that needs to stay mm-hmm. if i have a bit of money if i have a house that needs to stay and this is fine i mean ultimately these are real necessary survival instincts yeah. that are built into us mm-hmm. The spiritual masters have learned how to overcome even their survival instincts. 
So much so that they said, even if you beat me, even if you torture me, even if you have to kill me, I am no longer going to put my suffering on that. I'm going to be happy regardless of anything that happens around me. Mm -hmm. And why? Because they've learned that to hold on to things in life is a very unrealistic way of looking at life. Attachments is don't move anything. This is my life is good now. Let, let everything stay the same. And the masters are telling you life is always changing. Your unrealistic expectations that life is going to stay the same is going to cause you suffering because life is definitely going to change. Right. So your attachments are the number one reason. Mm. That's interesting, isn't it? Because suffering um, also brings a lot of ego out as well. And the reason I say that is I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate. Um, I've seen so many people talk about their suffering and their problems and how they're bigger than other people's problems. Uh, and it almost makes you feel more important um, and more cared for. And I really feel like there's deep rooted issues there, obviously, because this is the way of getting attention um, and filling that void that you need love and attention from other people by saying, please feel sorry for me. Um, I am suffering and I've always suffered and the I'm victim a victim, mindset. right? Yeah. Uh, that causes a lot of issues for a lot of people as well because you're afraid to ask how are you to certain people because you know it's just going to spiral out of control. Wh why do people victimize themselves? It's because there's something rewarding for them. And I'm, we're not trying to trivialize anyone who's going through real Absolutely. difficulties in their life. Of course. We're talking about people who like to make a drama about everything. Mm -hmm. And we all know people like that. That's right. And there is something very rewarding in saying, oh, look at me. And people saying, oh, you poor thing. Life is so bad for you. I feel so sorry for you. Come, sit down. Your way, it's a way of getting attention. Mm -hmm. And... When we learn from spiritual teachers, they teach us that of all the things that is causing your suffering, the biggest one is your sense of self-importance. Mm. I'm important. Look at me. Right. What about me? Your self-importance sometimes is called your ego, yeah. your I amness. Mm -hmm. That is the one thing that we don't want to deal with. And in fact, we can go our whole lives not even being aware that it exists. Right. It's just so built into our psyche, built into our mind, we don't even know that we have this thing called self-importance. Mm -hmm. Or if we do, we think you should, you should be looking after yourself. In so, fact, we're brought up by saying, be number one, yeah. do better than everyone else. You should be the one that gets the job. You should be the one that gets the promotion. You have to be top of your class. We, we're yeah. brought up with building up our self-importance mm -hmm. and the spiritual masters are sitting back and going, let's see where that gets you. It's so um, interesting because it's such a vicious cycle. Uh, there's so many layers that need to be taken off before you can, unlearning is the hardest, right? I, it, that's probably why most of us are still searching and most of us never reach that point of peace and contentment. Because we don't even think about the things that we've been doing conscious, consciously, subconsciously, unconsciously. We don't, we don't know. We're not shown these things. So self-awareness, um, how does that come? How, how do we work towards that? Because I feel like that's almost like a first step uh, to finding peace, if we can ever find peace. Depends how deep you want to go with this conversation. <laughs> um, self-awareness is a big subject. I got this question the other day that was, shouldn't we have self-love? And my response to that question was, which self are you going to love? And most people don't know their selves. In fact, the spiritual masters are saying, when you really know yourself, then you'll have self-awareness. One of the beautiful teachings from the Guru says, Man tu jod hai, apna mool It's literally saying, God is inside you. Go and recognize it. The light of God is inside you. You should know this. And that's not just for the Punjabis or the Indians or the Sikhs. It's talking to all mankind, every human being. It's saying there is something divine and sacred inside you. Go find it. That's where you'll find peace and contentment. So when somebody asks, what is myself? What is self-awareness? 
it is the start of a very long conversation, which is, first I have to show you what you are not. And maybe a simple way to, to, to look at self-awareness is, think about, if I was to ask you, tell me something about who you are. You know, we're meeting for the first time. Tell me something about who you are. I'm willing to bet I could guarantee all the things that you would tell me. You would say, okay, my name, this is who I am, this is where I was born, this is my family, this is this, this is that. You would tell me all the things that you know about yourself. And I say, tell me more. You say, this is my job, I used to be this, but now I'm this. I'll say, tell me more. And you say, well, I eat this food and I don't like this food. Right. I, I, I watch these sports and I don't like doing this. These are my hobbies. And so you start to tell me everything that you know about yourself. Mm -hmm. And then I ask you, of all of the things that you've told me about yourself, which one did you create? Mm -hmm. And then you start to think, oh, that's an interesting question. Did I create my name? No, my parents gave it to me. Did I create this body? No, I didn't create this body. I didn't even choose my gender. I just was born into this body. I, don't, I didn't choose whether I was going to be male or female. Did I choose my religion? No. Did I choose my ethnicity? No. Did I even choose my job? Most likely, no. My parents told me what to do or somebody influenced me and said, you really should be a doctor. Okay, I'll be a doctor. Did I choose what team I was going to support? That's a lovely question when you ask, especially uh, young, young men, young women. What team do you support? I just support the team of the town that I was born in. So which one of these are you? And you very quickly realize nothing that you know about yourself is yours. So what self-awareness are we going to talk about? That's the start of self-awareness. First realize none of these things are yours. Mm. Then the interesting question is what is really mine? Purpose is something that we're constantly looking for, right? And that would be something that would define an individual. Um, my purpose makes me who I am. How do you find your purpose? What is your purpose? A lot of people spend 20, 25 years doing things that are not satisfying. They're doing it because it brings a paycheck to them. And they know that this is not aligning with them and who they actually are. And I often see people saying, I, I'm just finding, I'm trying to find my purpose. I haven't found it yet. Um, this is a very new problem. Mm. And it's because we live in a world where there are lots of opportunities. Right. I want you to cast your mind back to a hundred years ago in India. Mm -hmm. If you were the son of a farmer, how easy is it for you to say, I'm going to become a doctor? Mm -hmm. Almost impossible. Yep. You would say, my dad was a farmer, my granddad was a farmer, my great granddad, and so I'm a farmer. Right. Most people never even ask the question, what is my purpose? And a lot of the times now when we ask that question, what we're really saying is, what are my career choices? Mm. What do I do with my time? So this is a very new phenomenon where people are saying, what do I do with my time? And it's almost a problem because we have all the options in front of us. True. True. And so are we conflating purpose with how I spend my day? Mm. I would say the real question is, how do I spend my day doing whatever I need to do and be content. Right. I genuinely believe every human being's purpose is contentment. Mm -hmm. But we don't find contentment in one job and we assume the job is the reason that we don't find contentment. So then we look for another job. If we're single, we say, I have all the financial success, but I'm not content. So my purpose is that I want to have a life partner or my purpose is to be a parent. You just go and ask someone who does all those things and then say, are you content? Most parents are not content. We do our job, we love our children, but that's not who we are. So the way society will answer this question is very different to how our gurus and the spiritual teachers will answer this question. They'll say your purpose is to recognize something deeper about yourself, that deep within you, there is an ocean of contentment and your purpose is to find it because you're born inquisitive knowing that I should be able to find contentment and that's why nothing else will stick. So the society will tell you, oh, your purpose is to follow your passions, mm -hmm. follow your dreams. And that's a very new thing. Nobody was told to follow their dreams a hundred years ago right. because there was no social mobility. There was no room to move around. You were what you were, right. deal with it, mm -hmm. find happiness in that. I'm really happy that conversations about mental health have also started 
happening lately, especially in the Punjabi community. Because um, it was one of the topics that used to be brushed under the rug constantly. Um, I, I'm seeing more and more men get vulnerable. Um, I've had so many conversations where uh, people have felt like this is a safe space and they've opened up in ways that they wouldn't usually. Um, so that makes me happy. But also it makes me think, is mental health um, any of these issues, anxiety, depression, whatever we are feeling, are they new or did they always exist and now we just have terms to define them? I think in English, we certainly have terms to define them. I think in Punjabi, we're still struggling to have language around this. Right. Until very recently, if somebody said, I have mental health issues, think about the words that you would use in Punjabi to describe that person. Yeah. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even want to say them, but the, yeah. the equivalent would be that, oh, you're crazy. Yeah. Those but, are the words that we yeah. use. Bagal ho gaya. Bagal ho gaya. Yeah. So mental health now is starting to develop the language around it that says, no, I'm not crazy, but I have anxiety issues. Mm -hmm. I worry a lot. I find myself getting emotionally low quite a lot and I've experienced depression. We have the language around that stuff. So I don't think that it's new. I think that one of the most important things that are happening right now is the ability to talk about them where they weren't there 10, 10 15 years ago. Mm. But I do believe people have always had these emotions, right. but they haven't necessarily had the terminology for them mm -hmm. and they haven't necessarily had the avenues to talk about them. And both those things are opening up now. How does um, the teachings of the Guru help with mental health issues that the world is facing at the moment? Because I feel like for the last especially after the pandemic, the way things have amplified, um, it's quite evident. The gurus have only been talking about mental health. Mental health is spirituality. Maybe another way to put it is mental well-being is spirituality. And I was having a conversation with a lady just yesterday who attended one of my seminars. And she said, because of listening to your lectures, I now am no longer addicted to mm. substance abuse. And, and I said, please explain more. I want to know how, what was the shift? And she said, you helped me understand through the spiritual wisdom that what I was looking for was a quick fix to get away from my, my problems, my, my emotional state. And I would always go towards a substance, alcohol, drugs, whatever it is. And she said, the switch that happened one day after learning spiritual wisdom was I realized if this is the body of God, if this is the body of the divine, why would I put a substance like that in here? And she said, overnight, after listening to, to, to your, your wisdom for, for a while, overnight a shift happened and she said, I no longer feel like I'm related to those substances anymore. They no, no longer a part of me. I'm now part of this thing called God, sacred living, the divine. and. Uh, why would I put those things in my body? Wow. And so it has a real ability because it has the ability to shift your identity, shift who you think you are, how you know yourself. And I genuinely believe that all human beings have the ability to realize that they are one with the universe. And as long as you don't feel that connection, that you're one with something far greater, you feel small and limited. You feel trapped. And because you feel trapped. You don't know what's causing that. You think your children are causing that. Your partner is causing that. Your manager at work is causing that. The lack of money is causing that. But the reality is that there is every human being's desire to feel huge. It's like the wave forgetting that it's part of the ocean. And it always knows that it's missing something, but it doesn't really know that it's, it's already connected to the ocean. Spirituality is literally just opening that door within your mind and saying, you're okay, you're the ocean. You're not a wave. You're not small. You're one with everything. And the amount of freedom, mental freedom that comes from that is so satisfying, is so freeing, is so liberating that you are able to deal with life. And that's what everyone is just struggling to do. They don't know how to deal with life. And we're, we're trying to use other methods to deal with life. And some of them work. Money's pretty good. 
It's a good way of dealing with life. But what happens when m- the money dries up? Are you still going to be okay? What happens when your cars and your wealth and your social status and your reputation and the number of followers you have online, when all of that goes? Then what? The masters are going to give you a method of happiness that is going to last. Nothing if, else will do that. If someone's feeling anxious, is going through anxiety, depression, diagnosis has already happened, and they know what the issues are, um, how do they get started or connected with, um, with the teachings? So when we talk about anxiety, depression, there's many levels to this. Of course. Some people are at the lower end of the spectrum. Some people need medical intervention and they need the, um, the medication that helps them. So, you know, depression is a very wide term mm-hmm. and it, there isn't sort of a one size fits all solution. But if we talk about people who are just sort of experiencing these emotions, they've gone to the doctor saying, I think you've got, I think you've got this problem or this problem. Most of the time, the doctors will, will prescribe you a, 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 a medication. medication of some sort. Right. And now they're starting to prescribe some of the alternative therapies, talking therapies and, and, and things like that. Where the spiritual wisdom would help is to help you identify the root causes of these things. And that's where I feel like certainly Western medicine and psychology is still not dealing with the root cause of these problems. And a lot of the times the, 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 the spiritual wisdom will teach you through meditation and through wisdom will teach you the art of letting go. Mm-hmm. And I think it sounds so overly simplistic, but it is, I promise you, one of the most powerful techniques and methods is just learning to let go. And a lot of the times we don't know how to let go because the thing that we're worried about is important to us in our life. How do I let go? My child is ill. You want me to let go? Or I'm not going to get enough money for my rent this month. You want me to let go? What does that even mean? And so people don't know how to deal with these things because it just sounds like a simple turn. And it almost, when you say that to people, they think you're being patronizing. Mm-hmm. Oh, just let it go. You'll be fine. That doesn't mean that the wisdom is wrong. It means that you don't know how to apply that technique. And that's where some of these things take a little bit of time to learn. But learning to let go has been one of the most powerful things that I've seen time and time again has helped so many people. I guess it's like surrendering. And yeah, which is interesting because a lot of people feel like they need to control things. Um, And I think the perception is that we are the ones controlling everything, which we really are not. Um, So it makes you feel vulnerable and you're fearful, um, makes you feel weak almost to a large degree that if you let go, then you're letting go of control. Well, that's interesting because when you say you let go of control, you still feel fearful. That means you've let go of the control, but you haven't let go of the outcome. Mm -hmm. You're saying, I know I still want the outcome to go this way, but I now realize that I may not be the one controlling the outcome. Right. But letting go means letting go of the outcome. Mm -hmm. It's the number one teaching of the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. Your job is to, is to do what you need to do regardless of what the outcome is. Mm. You know, Krishna is telling Arjuna on the battlefield, you're here to fight the battle, not worrying about how it's going to come out, come out at the end. Yeah. And we don't know how to do that. We think too much about the outcome. And again, it's I can hear the people sitting at home listening to this and going, well, the outcome does matter. Surely it matters. Of course. Of course it does in a, in a lot of scenarios. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying don't care. I'm not saying don't look after your kids. Don't go to work. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's like playing a game. Mm-hmm. And this is a really interesting way of looking at it. Have you ever played a game with a child and the child is taking the board game way too seriously like a game of chess? Oh, yes. And you're playing the game and the child is just so engaged with it and they're getting frustrated when they're losing their pieces. As an adult... You're able to play the game, you're, you're, you're doing all the things, but there's a part of you that knows it's just a game. It's okay. Even if I lose or if I win, it's, it's not a big deal. The spiritual masters are doing the same thing. Mm. They're looking at us taking life too seriously and they're saying, it's okay. Even this is a game. So you can participate in life, but having a little bit of a attitude that actually I need to step back from it. Life is going to turn out the way life is going to turn out. I need to do my bit, Mm -hmm. but I also need to be able to take a step back and say, it's okay. Either way, it's going to be okay. 
as a parent, I know you're a parent as well, and you talked about children and board games, and it just came to my mind. Um, empathy and compassion is something that I think as parents we're really struggling with to cultivate in our kids and children, um, teaching them about kindness and empathy and compassion. I know I, know I do constantly talk about it. Um, is there a simple way to do it? <laughs> when you find it, let me know. <laughs> You know, I've got I've got two boys and they're relatively close in age. And so they, from a young age, are, are always competing with each other. Mm. They're competing for attention, even if there's just one biscuit on the table. No, I want it first. And and as a parent, it's so frustrating. We've got a cupboard full of biscuits. It's OK. You don't have to act like this. You know, be, yeah. be kind, be generous, you know, <laughs> share it, cut it in, in half. And But it's so frustrating. But interesting also to watch that it's it's almost like animalistic that you see in, in, in young children. And for me, I think the only method has been to be patient. Mm. Because as a parent, sometimes it's very easy to just snap and lose your temper. And that can, that can work for a short amount of time until the children start getting older. Then they start shouting back. And so then you realize, oh, I'm now creating a culture in the house that isn't very healthy. Right. So the best way is you have to be leading by example. Mm. And when they're young, it's hard. You can try and explain to them as many times. And the hardest thing for a parent is to actually just allow your children to go through what they need to do. Mm. I've seen my young boys now grow up into young men. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful to see them and say, oh, you're not a child anymore. Yeah. I don't need to parent you as much as, mm -hmm. as I did before. You're actually quite considerate. You're quite kind. You know, every now and then you re you still remember that they're children, but it's lovely to see yeah. that they do grow out of things as well. So you need patience and you need to be leading by example. I remember a time when my wife and my eldest son, when he was maybe about 10 years old, there was a certain period where they were always shouting and arguing with each other. That's just how their relationship had built up. It's not like that anymore, but there was a, a time and my son didn't have that relationship with me. And I was like, why is it happening there? And it just turned out that it became a, a question of matching each other's energy. Mm -hmm. If the parent is shouting, the child learns to shout back. And that just became the norm. And so you have to lead by example. That's mm -hmm. the only way. Right. They teach you a lot too, that's for sure. But patience is hard. <laughs> I always say that children bring out the best in you yeah. and the worst in you it's at the so same true. time. So true. You know, I um, whatever I know, and I don't know a lot of Guru Nanak Dev Ji's teachings, um, equality was always one of the philosophies and that was taught to us as kids. Uh, but somewhere, I feel like it got lost. Uh, we talk about, without even realizing that we're doing it, uh, so openly about the differences, uh, which area you come from, which caste do you belong to, um, what... Um, even with females and males in the community, the patriarchy is so, so engraved in us. It's, it's incredible that it's just, it's in workplaces, it's in homes, and it's so visible, which makes me wonder, um, do we really understand what has been taught to us and what the philosophy and the traditional teachings are actually there for? I think it's so ingrained in human societies and yeah. cultures. I think sometimes we like to blame our people and say, oh, look how bad mm -hmm. it is. But really, I think it's a human problem. Right. It's a human problem of always wanting to be on top, be the leader, and always wanting to segregate. These are our people. Don't marry into that caste. Those people are not good. It's a human, it's almost a natural tendency. And I, I sometimes I learn about how humans behave and how people behave. When I go back and think about how did our sort of ancestors behave in sort of tribal communities and cavemen times. And if you think about humans, who they were almost mm -hmm. in the earlier stages, we very quickly would always create little tribes. And so it's built into the human mindset to always segregate. Mm -hmm. When the tribe becomes too big, you make smaller tribes. And we know this, that when, you know, when there's too many people in one Gurdwara, you open a second Gurdwara on the other side of the road. That's what it looks like today. You create and then, you know, you call one Gurdwara for one caste and one for another caste. And so it, it's something built into human society that we're always trying to create inequalities and saying our group is better than your group. And we do this even in the family. Mm. So the men are in control and the women are subservient. 
And you realize that that's why we need the teachings. Because the teachers saw these things and they spoke out against it. You know, Guru Nanak Dev Ji was a real champion against um, inequalities, against inequalities in the homes, in gender disparity, in caste, in all sorts, any, in, in rich and poor, you know, and, and we still have those issues today, you know, in social classes. Absolutely. That's why those teachings were needed. And yet those teachings are still relevant now. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a failing of the teachings. I think it's a testament to how true those teachings were that hundreds of years later, we still see human beings acting in the same way. Right. And you can still take that ancient old wisdom and say, look, mm -hmm. you're still doing it now. You still need to see a different way of look looking at life. We're still discriminating against our own um, in so many ways. And that just makes me wonder. It's disappointing, isn't it? It is disappointing. It definitely is. Um, a lot of... Uh, youth is going through mental health issues, which really um, is alarming. There's a lot of a huge um, student population came to Canada, which I'm sure you've been hearing about in the last few years, and the isolation of being away from home, the struggles that they're going through. All of a sudden, not knowing you're in a different country, it's a different language, it's a different lifestyle, it's um, you're being discriminated against. So th there's a lot of underlying issues that these students are facing. And one of them on the top is mental health issues. There's a lot of self-harm and suicides happening in the community as well. Um, how, do we, how do we bridge that gap? How do we, sometimes I wonder if, we, if there is an answer to it. Sometimes I wonder if there's a solution where we can just embrace each other and create a sense of community and just say, here, we'll take care of each other. Um, it is happening, but it's not happening at the speed that it should be. One of the things I find, especially with young students who've come over from, from India and other countries, is they come here with the mindset that this is the place to succeed mm. and to then to show the families back home that I'm successful, I'm studying well, I'm able to work and earn money, and I'm able to cover my fees and pay my rent and maybe send some money home. Mm -hmm. And for a young 18, yeah. 19 year old child, these are children really, yeah. that's a lot of pressure to put on them. And then you put them in another country where they are speaking English as a second language, mm -hmm. where they don't know too many people, and they're isolated from even their own family members by thousands of miles, mm -hmm. it's no wonder that they're experiencing so much mental health issues. Right. So where is the solution? Were they better off just staying back home? But then you get mental health issues where you're feeling like, I'm not getting the opportunities that I would if I went abroad. And for me, one of the big things is really about community. And I'm, I'm noting this, noticing a lot with the, with, with the youngsters as mm -hmm. well. They spend most of their time either in education or in jobs to try and pay for that education. And they really don't have any sort of social circles. And then people who are born and brought up in the West, they don't necessarily want to mingle with them because they see that, you know, the culturally we're, we're too different. Mm -hmm. People who are born and brought up in the West saying we don't even right. speak the same language as them. It's like, you know, it's, it's like two different communities. Mm -hmm. And so what you're getting is people who are just very isolated and there's no sense of community. So I think that's one of the easiest ways mm -hmm. to start dealing with mental health solutions, especially with young students, is right. create groups where they can just get together and socialize and just go and have fun and every now and then get get back some of that very essential human need of just connecting with each other. So true. We it, It's so, um, the perception is that we all connected. Social media has made it really, it, we're almost delusional that we all connected yet we are so isolated in our own worlds. And I feel like the comparisons happening on social media also make us feel like we need more. We really need, we're not doing enough. Yeah. Our life is not enough. Yeah. And the person um, that I'm following is probably living it up. And we often forget that these are the highlights. Although a lot of people know that people are putting their best behavior on social media and it's a highlight reel, but I feel like- You're still only seeing that. Right? And you can't help, but that's what you're seeing. Yeah. I mean, I know from being in social media myself for the last 10 years, mm -hmm. I've seen so-called influencers mm -hmm. also burn out yeah. and say, I was just spending too much time putting up this content to show how great my life was. Mm -hmm. And it became a way of me 
masking the fact that I myself wasn't doing so well and eventually they just burn out. So 100% what you're following on social media is a very fake curated version of somebody's life. Absolutely. And one of the things personally and I think this is where it comes down to is is are we complicit in that? Mm. Are we actually adding to the problem? One of the things you'll notice if anyone follows me on social media, I almost never post. Right. Because I could very easily post every time I travel somewhere in the world. Look, there's a picture of me. I'm now in Canada. I'm now in Australia. I'm now in in Malaysia. I would then be adding to the problem. Now somebody would think, "Well, that's quite innocent. Mm-hmm. You're just showing your followers that you're abroad." Yeah, but I'm also not showing them when I'm sitting at home and I'm not all, you know, looking perfect and and I'm feeling a little bit bored. I'm not showing them that part of my life. Why do I only show one one part of it? Mm-hmm. So one of the things I try to do is I'm asking myself this question. how are you making people feel better and i know that if i put pictures of myself doing only the best things that i'm not making people feel better in- instantly somebody's going to look at that and there is going to be a feeling in- inside them that said i wish i was on a plane right now right. going flying somewhere abroad and so we have to start with ourselves mm. don't participate in that and also be very careful with who you're following right oh you know, i've muted so many accounts and it's a blessing to be able to do that there's a couple other things that i really want to talk about one of them is grief a lot of people deal with a um debilitating grief and that could be grief of losing a loved one um it could be losing a job um a relationship what is the best way to deal with grief if we had to rely on the teachings of course you're asking very big questions <laughs> and you're you're expecting one minute answers <laughs> you know with grief it's very interesting when you look at modern psychology they talk about we're going to talk about grieving the loss of a loved one for example they say that there are five steps to grief uh it starts with denial and anger and things like that and the last step is acceptance what's very interesting is spiritual teachers have said that there's only one step to dealing with grief and it's always acceptance mm-hmm. we get told that time is the biggest healer and that's actually not true acceptance is the biggest healer now the only question is how long how much time is it going to take to, for you to accept and for some people it can be shorter and for some people it can be decades you hear from people all the time 25 years ago my mom died and i'm still not over it so that's the question of how long do you want to keep carrying this pain mm. what are you hoping to achieve what what do how do you see sikhi and gurmat and the teachings of the guru um in the next in an ideal world in the next 50 100 years how do you want it integrated in the community ideally For me I set out a mission when I wanted to to start to teach this mm. in my own way and the mission is taking gurmat global and my vision honestly is that I truly believe the teachings of guru nanak dev ji are really applicable to all people and somehow we've locked it into one religion one language one place one religious institution and i don't think we're even doing justice to what guru nanak dev ji rec- demonstrated in his own life we proudly say that he traveled all over the world teaching to all communities and yet we're not doing that so one of the things i try and sort of do is ask myself is this if i'm going to say something does it appeal to everyone does it apply to everyone and for me my vision would be that we have a lot more teachers who don't feel restricted by teaching the wisdom in the old ways it doesn't have to be done on a gurdwara stage it could be done on social media mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be done wearing a kurta pajama it could be done in in english right. in everyday modern clothes using everyday examples and finding ways to make this wisdom really applicable is i think one of the only ways that we're going to be able to not spread the religion i'm not interested in converting mm-hmm. any people to to any other religion stay in your own religion i don't really care but i really believe in this wisdom because it has such an ability to make people's lives better so why wouldn't we want to share that as far and wide as possible i can already envision my comment section and number one comment is going to be punjabi ch gal kyu nahi kiti i can't even imagine um what you go through exactly what you said that we are tying religion to one language um ਤੁਸੀਂ ਦਿਖਦੇ ਕਿਵੇਂ ਹੋ 
that is more important. Yeah. Um, to security pasha bolte, that's more important yeah. and than everything else. I'm sure you go through that a lot as well. All the time. And my number one response for why I don't teach in Punjabi is because I think in English. I was born and brought up thinking in English. Mm-hmm. And Guru Nanak Dev Ji didn't teach in Punjabi. Right. Guru Granth Sahib Ji has at least 13, 14 different languages. So every place that Guru Nanak went, he didn't say Punjabi sikho, Punjabi bolo. He didn't say, I have something amazing to teach you, but first you have to dress a certain way, look a certain way, learn my language, then I'll teach you. No, he did the opposite. He dressed like them and he spoke like them. And then he said, I have something amazing to teach you for your life. So if my guru would do that, why wouldn't I do that? I want Sikhi to be taught in Chinese, in Spanish, in Portuguese, in every language under the sun. If somebody was watching today, um, what would be the number one thing that you would ask them to include in their lifestyle starting today and incorporate it um, that aligns them with Sikhi and the teachings? The number one thing I would ask people to do is to start practicing inner peace. Mm. However you can do it, whatever method, most people are not actually practicing peace. And if you start to do that, it's the number one way that you can start to experience a shift in your own mind. Because we know what anger and frustration feels like, we know what worries and fears feel like, but most people don't really know what inner peace feels like. And so when we experience these so-called negative emotions, we don't know how to snap out of it because we don't know what the opposite is. Mm-hmm. So we only know anger, frustration, and in fact, we're told this is normal. It's good to experience a range of emotions. Yeah. But if you knew what peace was, you would not want to go on the emotional roller coaster all the time. You don't want to go very high and very low all the time. You're just floating above. And it's a really good place to be. That's beautiful. I have so many things I want to talk to you about, but we're running out of time. So, Paul, you have to promise that you're going to come back. Part two. That's going to be in, that's going to be in your comments. We need him back. No, I've, I've, I've loved being here. Thank you so much for having me. I, I love just sitting and having conversations like this. So Beautiful. Anytime. Thank you so much. I'm enlightened. <laughs>